Hey, everyone. Welcome to Locked on Lakers for Wednesday. Brian Kamenetsky, Andy Kamenetsky. Andy, the Lakers on Tuesday played a classic game where absolutely nothing had to give in Dallas, and it didn't, and they lost. And now the Lakers, at least for now, are even out of the play-in. Lots to unpack next on Locked on Lakers. You are Locked on Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks to everybody for making Locked On Lakers your first listen of every day, uh, Monday through Friday, sometimes Saturdays and Sundays. We get this thing up as quickly as we possibly can for you. Uh, so remember, subscribe to Locked On Lakers on YouTube and you get it early, especially on non-game days. We do uh, we do get that up faster. It's a little bonus, Andy, for the for the YouTube people, the, the kids. The kids like the YouTube now. Um, it's very popular. Uh, with people, uh, not popular with people, the Lakers. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so uh, they go into. The, I'm just going to tell people, look, like there, there is. It's it's apropos, Brian, that LeBron recently won a Razzie. <laughs> like yeah. it, it was overshadowed by all of the basketball of this previous weekend, and then you know the Oscars and the slap heard around the world with Will Smith and Chris Rock. But uh, LeBron that Saturday won a Razzie for his work in Space Jam, A New Legacy. And I don't think it was that bad. (laughs) I know know the movie wasn't that bad, although we will, I think, inspired by that, be giving out our own Razzie. The season for the Lakers certainly deserves a Razzie. It it says something to me that that Tuesday night's 128-110 to loss to Dallas, in Dallas, um, in a season of Razzies, I'm not even sure this game would be nominated. Like, if you had to have five games that you would put up for a Razzie oh. Award, this one wouldn't be nominated. Oh, absolutely not. Right. I mean, and, is it, and it, was, it, was, it was a god-awful game. I mean, it was terrible from the, yeah, from the I mean, moment the game started. It was terrible. Look, they lose 128-110 to the Mavericks in Dallas. No LeBron, no Anthony Davis. Mm-hmm. So the baseline there is already low. And then you throw in a perfectly serviceable you know, t- serviceable to good, 25 points, eight rebounds, six assists, just two turnovers from Russell Westbrook. Malik Monk, 28 points, 10 of 16 from the field, six of 10 from behind the arc. A lot else stunk, but I'm sorry. This game in the grand scheme of this season, like th- this game isn't even in the conversation nope. for a Razzie. Nope, not even close. It's um, insulting to the Razzies that you even go there. Lakers were down 43 to 25 after one. They gave <laughs> 82 points in the first quarter, in the first half. Sadly, 82. still doesn't feel razzy worthy. This no, 82. Season. That's like that is a lot. That is, is a lot, lot of points to give up it in a, a half. Um, um, you can but, say Luca carved the ever living crap out of him in the first half of this game. Well, Oof. and we'll get to this in a second because um, the most interesting thing I think to come out of this game, in part, was the way that that players reacted to it. Uh, including Stanley Johnson, who had the unenviable task of uh, trying to check Luka Doncic, which is not easy, uh, particularly when you're significantly shorter. Um, and when the the team defense around you is lacking, right? And 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 you're just you know, and you're guarding Luka Doncic. Yeah, uh, you're just smaller. I mean, and all that stuff. So, uh, but let's let's talk about the injury stuff because there was a fair amount of of news coming out of the game, which is relevant because the with this loss, the Lakers, if the season ended today, which wouldn't be the worst outcome. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Things are going so badly for the Lakers this season, you can't even get that. Nope. Oh, unfortunately, I got to play the rest of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they would not qualify even now for the play-in game. They are officially in a tie with the San Antonio Spurs after Tuesday's games. Uh, and that means the Spurs are ahead of them. The Spurs have a better conference record. They have the tiebreaker. The Lakers need to finish clear of San Antonio in order to even make the play-in game where they would almost surely travel to New Orleans where this 11-win road team would probably lose. But um, anyway, LeBron James, Chris Haynes reported uh, during the game is not expected to play Thursday. Um, He seems unlikely to play Friday. And... Um, you know, maybe we're talking Sunday, um, uh, before he gets back on the floor and that's against Denver, who obviously has a ton to play for themselves. Um, meanwhile, Anthony Davis though, might 
be available. Uh, I think the, Haynes reported that the, the Lakers are really targeting either Friday or Sunday. So it's one more game the Lakers are going to play without those two guys. That's Thursday in Utah. Um, I'm going to go ahead and chalk that up as an L. It's getting really, like, if you were one of these people who were sort of really hanging on for dear life about the, the playing game, it's getting real dicey. The Spurs play Memphis on Wednesday. Okay, maybe they lose that one. Um, but then they go back to back at home against <laughs> Portland. <laughs> it's not even like a home and road, Andy. It's home and home against Portland. Okay. I just want to drive home, Brian, how fortunate this is for San Antonio and how unfortunate this is for the Lakers in terms of clinging to those hopes of trying to get that 10 seed and then make the mother of all runs. The most recent game Portland played uh, was against the Oklahoma City Thunder because Damian Lillard, Anthony Simons, Yusef Nurkic all shut down for the season. Josh Hart is currently hurt. This was the starting five for the Portland Trailblazers in this game. Um, I have them ranked in terms of I know who they are down to don't know who that is. In, Drew, in order, a starting five in order of familiarity. Yes, exactly. Drew Eubanks, I, I know who he is. He's a big man. He's been in the league Tall a few fella. years. Yeah. yeah, with San Antonio, I'm guessing off the top of my head, traded to them for Zach Collins. I'm not sure. But anyway, I know who he is. Well, he was, wasn't he in Toronto? But anyway, we know who he is. Keon Johnson, I know who he is largely because last year, Brian, he and this year he played for the Clippers. That's right. So he's local for me. CJ Ellaby, I know who he is mostly because he has really fun, floppy hair. He's like a B-list Josh Giddy. FFH, fun floppy hair. Elijah Hughes. I don't know I, what that is. I, I think I know who he is, but I'm not positive I'm right. And then finally, Brandon Williams. I have no idea who that is. Not Brandon Williams clue. is, and kudos to Brandon Williams for making the league. I mean, this is very impressive, but that sounds like a name that you make up when you don't have the rights to the player, like in the okay. video game. Brandon Williams is in some teen movie about basketball. Like, yeah. I, I have no clue who that is. And you and I follow this league pretty closely. I, I am, Andy, I, look, I am in the most intense fantasy basketball league that you can <laughs> yes. possibly imagine, where <laughs> literally, if you have a pulse, you get picked up by someone in my league, not only because it's highly competitive, but also because it's a keeper league. So people are constantly looking for, you know, a guy who might be a great keeper for next year that shocks the world, all the, you know, the you know, uh, you know, the, the, the functional equivalent of Albert Pujols, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, in your basketball league. Um, I don't know who that is. <laughs> and he's still on the wire. So, no, actually not true. He has been picked up. But like, you can't tank your way past the Lakers. Like, I, I know what Portland is up to. I'm, I'm, I don't think they're particularly, or San Antonio, I don't think they're particularly interested in, you know, highly motivated to get that, that play-in spot. I don't think they're trying to avoid it. But even if you wanted to, can you actually tank your way past the Lakers? That's, I'm not sure it's possible. That's part of the problem, Brian. And I did some digging also because I was just, I'm trying to come up with reasons to hang in there. Even if they feel forced, Brian, even if they work a little hard. <laughs> You're the cat in the poster right now, Andy. Yes. <laughs> and I, I, I went and took a look. <laughs> I'm really hanging in there, baby. I went and took a look at like Tankathon, the Lakers schedules we've established much harder down the stretch than San oh, Antonio's. God, yes. But then I was like, okay, there are rebuilding teams, San Antonio. So maybe they don't even want to make the playoffs because they're worried about losing the uh, potential for the lottery. And, you know, they, they've, they've got to be thinking about the future. But then I started looking at real GM. They've already mm -hmm. got Boston's pick protected anywhere from 5 to 30, which they're clearly going to get. They have Toronto's pick, 15 through 30, which feels likely to hit because they're on pace to make the playoffs, finish yeah, in the Toronto's, top half Toronto's of the league. The playoffs. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And then with their own pick, San Antonio's, it's very difficult, Brian, not just to tank your way past the Lakers where they're playing right now, but they really got to fall hard to juice their odds from like, 20% of getting a top four pick 
to 30, 35. They're like the math yeah. doesn't work for them. So at this point, they might as well just take their chances with getting some of these guys more playoff experience. Well, look, I mean, the way that, they probably can't pull it off anyway. This and they're is, good this at drafting the thing, mid to late anyway. They, they've yeah, got a track I mean, record of this. Anyway. They're good at so, it. This gets to where the Lakers are. It's like I they're not going to win on Thursday, but let's talk about what happens beyond that. If uh, you know, if Anthony Davis is able to return, is there enough here that again, you got to finish clear of San Antonio, you got to finish a game ahead of these guys at this point? Is that even possible? That's next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by Prize Picks. Okay, Laker fans, you've been hearing me tell you about Prize Picks for months. If you have not signed up yet, you are missing out because this is daily fantasy made. Easy. You're going to love this app for NBA and mixed sports pickums. And for a limit time, limited time, here's a no brainer of an offer for all of our users. Users get 50 bucks for free if a player in your first prize picks entry scores a single point, like one point. That's yeah. it. Don't pick, pick a Laker. <laughs> well, pick LeBron. If LeBron's playing, he's going to he's get that. Score, I would just steer clear of the team. I would just, <laughs> it's a safe way to handle it. But okay, no matter who you pick, Got to use the code NBA because that's the exclusive offer available for locked on fans who use the code NBA. Prize Picks has the best NBA DFS prop game on the market. Prize Picks offers more NBA props than any other DFS prop operator. They offer a handful of superstar players as well as bench players that only get a handful of minutes each game. And Prize Picks offers this is fun mixed sport entries. You could take the over on. LeBron's points with the under on Freddie Freeman home runs in a game Ooh. in the same entry. Mix it up. Make it weird. Make it fun. Use the award-winning app on the App Store or Google Play. Entries can be made to 60 seconds or less. They offer fast withdrawals. They're safe. So, again, prizepicks.com. Use the promo code NBA or go to the App Store. Download the app. If you're not playing prize picks, again, you don't know what you're missing. Okay, so the Lakers essentially will take the floor uh, on Thursday – or at least, I'm sorry, let's do it this way. The Lakers wake up Wednesday, functionally a game out of the playoffs. Um, mm -hmm. If you call the play-in game a playoff, you know, the playoffs. It's playoff they've got seven games. games left. They play yeah. the Jazz, the Pelicans again, the Nuggets, uh, the Suns, the Warriors, the Thunder, and then the Nuggets again. And I always like when Thunder Nuggets is close to <laughs> the giggle. Like that's there's not a lot of wins there, uh, particularly if LeBron isn't playing. You know, you could argue maybe Speaking the of Suns. Thunder Nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you could argue the Suns um, will be, yeah, you know, resting everybody and stuff like that. But the Suns hate the Lakers, <laughs> and even if they're resting everybody, they're going to come out and play hard against LA uh, because they just resent everything about the Lakers. The Warriors will have something to play for. The Nuggets very well have something to play for in both of those games. Um, Okay, the Thunder, fine, but the Lakers have shown they can't beat them. Pelicans, obviously, incentivized to keep playing. The Jazz, incentivized to keep playing. Um, I'm not sure where the wins come from. And, you know, it was funny. I was th The frustration level on Lakers Twitter was certainly very high um, in, on, on Tuesday night. And, you know, at halftime, and this is not unusual, Shaq on the TNT broadcast was talking a lot about, you know, essentially implying that, you know, that these Lakers are an embarrassment because they've packed it in because they're not trying because they just don't care. And all this stuff. I gotta be honest with you. All like, the wrong reasons, by the way, that this team is an embarrassment. Well, it is. I mean, he's correct. But like, you know, there's, it's still this, there's this idea out there that the uniform imparts magical powers upon this team. And, you know, just because they are the Lakers and, Sorry, folks, the team that the Lakers put out there has one, two, you know, what I would say clearly better than average players in the NBA. Russell Westbrook is still better than average. Um, and Certainly I would say in this game. Yeah, he's, I, mean, I would say Russell Westbrook is a better than average NBA player. Um, Malik Monk, I think you could say now, is a better than average NBA player. And, never, and people say better than average. Average is like halfway. Like being better than average means you're in the top half of the league. That's pretty good. He is, if nothing else, a better than average scorer. Like yes, that's not even. I would debatable. agree. If you, if you, I would agree. The Lakers played Stanley Johnson, who was not in the league at the beginning of the year. Dwight Howard, who was barely in the league <laughs> this year. Um, and you know, only played five minutes. He played Austin Reeves, who is not supposed to be playing, uh, undrafted free agent. And I would say, at, you know, I think it, to be charitable is an average NBA player at this point, which by the way is good for an undrafted rookie free agent. 
Wenyan Gabriel wasn't in the league. Trevor who also got Trevor, hurt, by the way, should be yeah, noted, so, sprained oh, his ankle way. or yeah. twisted his ankle, did something to his ankle uh, in the last few minutes of the game. And it just lets you know where you are that in this garbage time, you have to play Wenyan Gabriel, who at this point is a rotation player because you don't really have anybody else. Right. But Trevor Reza doesn't belong in the league. Avery Bradley probably doesn't belong in the league. THT played 17 minutes, did okay, still banged up. And DJ Augustine was out of the league before the Lakers brought him back in. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, y- you cannot convince me that Stanley Johnson, Malik Monk, Austin Reeves, Wenyan Gabriel when he was out there, Trevor Reza plays hard. Like, uh, they, they were trying. This is a terrible collection of NBA players that were put. If this was a team over 82 games that you saw, you would look at it and say, there is not a prayer they would win 20 games. Well, here's what I would here's what I would say to your point. I disagree, and I've made this point a lot throughout the course of the season, that effort has not been a thing for mm-hmm. this team during the season. And, you know, the the desire to compete for the sake of competing, and that is by the way, something we're going to get into over the course of the show because it was something that came up. Yeah, it came up in post game. It was very during in, in the in interesting post-game. ways. Yes. Like I don't disagree that that has been a thing for this team. And it's one of the reasons I've said a lot. It isn't so much that this team has lost as many games as they have, it's often how they've lost those mm-hmm. games. But that doesn't mean it's a catch all explanation every time they lose. This was not a game where, in my opinion, and or knows I've been perfectly honest about this and I've been willing to go there. I don't think the effort was the issue in this game. No. Like there there have been times where even as a skeleton crew, I've questioned their effort before or you know how much they're really willing to go at it. Sometimes it depends who was playing as the skeleton crew, but in this particular game tonight, no. That was not the thing and you still do have to treat this on a game by game basis if you're going to talk about the game and particularly particularly Andy when you get into this you know you're in the 70 this was their 74th game 73rd game whatever it is now you're really starting this is the 36th starting lineup the Lakers have played this year and um <laughs> is that it's absurd 36 starting lineups they've now played uh, and they're probably they could get to 40 and that, I'm not kidding that feels low it, it actually I, feels it low. kind of does. You're right. Like, it feels like they've had a different one every game. But like now you're talking about too, like, well, why do they look so bad on defense? Why why are they so disorganized? Because these guys have played a grand total of seven minutes with each other all year long. You know, definitionally, Stanley Johnson, Dwight Howard, Malik Monk, and Austin Reeves can only have spent so much time on the floor together um, because half those guys weren't on the team for half the year. Um, and so you know, the Tuesday night's game drove home both the fragility of the team, which is obviously an issue, and the horribleness of this roster and the way that the roster, the depth of this roster and the middle class of this roster has been completely eviscerated. And certainly in a way that Russell Westbrook's talent hasn't been able to fill that gap. And we're going to talk to Eric Pincus, who wrote a fantastic feature for Bleacher Report, kind of laying out how the Lakers got from title season to here that's third an autopsy show. pretty yeah. honest it's, it's really what it, it is it, it is a great breakdown of stuff that gets not just in the players and the choices but also some of the really technical things that a guy like eric would know that you and i wouldn't pick up you know but like this roster which was cobbled together and improved andy by finding guys like gabriel and johnson and discovering that Austin Reeves can play and all that stuff, that actually improved what this roster was capable of doing. And it's still not good. It, it's not like it saved it. It just made wretched slightly better. Um, that was the problem that, to me, was completely exposed on Tuesday. I agree with everything you said, except the part about this game exposing it. It was exposed a long time before this game. That is true. Um, before, they have not though, been wearing pants in that regard for a long time. But <laughs> when we get back, though, uh, before we get to what Stanley Johnson and Malik Monk were saying, that if you are looking for some sincere positives, this was one. Um, could also talk a little bit about the question that we were asked. You mentioned that there's nothing Frank Vogel could have done yes. during this game or during this season to make this context better. Could Jason Kidd 
his former Ooh. lead assistant, now the coach of the Mavericks. Um, yeah. who's, those, are, who, those are interesting questions. We should talk yes. about all of that stuff next. Lockdown Lakers brought to you by Built Bar. Eating smart, but also enjoying what you're eating. It has never tasted better. You can treat yourself without feeling guilty. If you have not tried the puffs, you are missing out on one of Built Bar's best tasting bars. They are the first ever protein infused marshmallow. I would yeah, have never not even thought. Not a description of the Lakers roster. I would have never even thought of doing such a thing like that. Like, that's crazy. Protein and marshmallows, but Built Bar figured it out. You it's like that. it's like you expect some sort of Frankenstein monster to overtake the world and kill us all, but no, it turns into a delicious treat instead. I am, I imagine it was like the first time someone put peanut butter and jelly together. They were probably burned at the stake, and then afterwards people ate it, and they're like, you know what? We overreacted. Man, did we, we really owe Ted an apology. <laughs> you know what? We're going to name this sandwich after Mr. Peanut Butter and Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jelly. <laughs> a lot of great. Man, flavors. that was that we we at the very least we should have tasted it first. <laughs> that was our mistake right there. You know, the times used to be really, really savage. They, they would burn you with a steak for anything back then. <laughs> yes, yes. Really <laughs> low threshold for that. <laughs> this whole is, team. Lakers would have been up in smoke well, <laughs> three games something. into the season. They would never <laughs> tolerate this. If you brought out that sandwich and they suspected you were a witch. <laughs> Boy, which one anyways, of these great, great puff flavors like cinnamon, churro, <laughs> coconut, marshmallow. Toss banana, this whole Lakers pie. roster into the lake and see if it floats. <laughs> and unlike a candy bar, which is just usually empty calories, two to three hundred worth, most built bars just 130 calories, only four grams of sugar, four net carbs, but 17 grams of protein. Go to built.com, use the promo code locked15, get 15% off your order. Again, promo code locked15, 15% off at built.com. Um, give me that optimistic note because I couldn't find it other than I guess Russ played reasonably well. Um, Stanley Johnson and Malik Monk after the game were really emphatic about the idea of no, we still have a job to do when we go out here. We are, as Stanley Johnson put it, professionals. And as he put it, no team in the league he said no team in the world should have us down by 30. And while I would say that there probably are many teams that could, if nothing else, have you down by 20 at some point, what difference does it make? We what can I, quibble over could versus should, the number, but I, I like he, the sentiment. He and Malik were both very adamant and very emphatic about this is still a group of professionals with a lot of pride all really competitive by nature. Like Stanley Johnson's are like, look, we signed a damn contract to, to play basketball. Like there are obligations of us out here. And I got a sense from those guys that they perceive rightly that the general view on them right now is it's a washed up or past his prime Russell Westbrook with a bunch of role players. What the hell are they going to do against these teams? Or, or, or Andy? Or worse. And, right. and I say this after I just finished, you know, the last four minutes of the last segment was basically me dissecting this and calling people Stan like Stanley Johnson and Wenyan Gabriel and those guys inadequate. And right. so, I mean, and I don't and I think they personally. resent the idea of being I, treated yes. like helpless scrubs. I think they resent it. Stanley Johnson would object strongly to my little monologue at the end of the last segment. And as well, he should. And I don't mean it personally. Against, I think it's a great story that, that he's found his way back into the league. And I hope all of the, I don't root against players. I genuinely don't. Um, but that doesn't change the reality. And what I thought was really interesting about that, though, Andy, is you know, you and I actually covered back in, in our LA Times days, we also covered baseball. And there was a stretch where the Lake where the Dodgers had a bunch of veteran guys in the clubhouse. And um, 2007 a, season. Right. A bunch of young guys, the Matt Kemp, Andre Ethier, James Loney, all those, you know, Russell Martin, all those guys are coming up. And you got your Nomars and your Luis Gonzalez types and Brad Penny and Derek Lowe. And there was a huge divide between those guys. And so the, the vibe on Tuesday kind of reminded me. One of the me big of that. divides was the young guys were really cool, the older guys were. They jerks. were also better. Yes, um, and that's that's a little different than the dynamic this year. The older guys, in the sense of LeBron James, are still better than the younger guys. It's not a playing time issue. It's not a who does this team belong to issue. But there was a you would get a lot of games where you know the the team would not perform well. We'd all come into the the clubhouse, not the locker room, the clubhouse, 
and ask questions. And the only guys around would be the young guys taking accountability for stuff and whatever. And you wouldn't see Brad Penny, Derek Lowe and all that. What we saw on Tuesday was, you know, LeBron obviously didn't speak because he was hurt. Um, same with AD. Same with AD. Um, but, you know, Monk out there taking responsibility. He scored 26 points. Like, I didn't do enough. I, I did not do my job. 28 points. Uh, 28 points. Um, Johnson basically flayed himself for not being able to stop Luka Doncic. He's like, Luka got off to a great start. That buried us. It was my job to stop him. I didn't do it. This game is on me. And I'm, and I'm thinking that admirable. It's not fair, but it's admirable. And then you get to Russell Westbrook, who was very much in, mm, I don't know, you know, whatever, you know, and and not taking, I don't know what accountability I would expect, but those guys sat there and they answered questions and they they took it seriously and they took accountability and they showed some give a bleep just in their answering of the questions, which kind of supports my theory of why they lost this game. One could have effort. And Russ got into an argument with one of the beat writers about like, you know, who asked a pretty anodyne question about like, what can you do to change, try to change things, whatever. Well, what do you, what do you think should change? What do you, you know, and Russ just starts having this stupid argument with him and basically got up and walked away, cut the interview short. And I'm just thinking to myself, that's a terrible contrast. I'm pretty sympathetic to Russ for over the course of the season, but I thought Tuesday sucked. And you know, the, 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 what do you know? They said, it's a guy asking a simple I mean, question. I mean, he ended up to just for the sake of providing full context. Uh, it was with, uh, Brad Turner with the LA times. Mm -hmm. He's been around, he's been around forever. He's a great guy, but also he's not the guy to do this with. Like you're not going to intimidate, You're not going to intimidate Brad. BT and to not right. continue I mean, he, to ask questions. He covered like, Shaq, I think he may have covered Showtime. Like he's been around a while, and right. and by the way, the, the the clip of this exchange is is circulating around Twitter, so you can find, including it. our feed at Cam yes. Brothers. And just to make it clear, by the end of it, they kind of hashed it out. It was cool. Russ, Russ, and him had like a bro hug. Russ was like joking with the cameras. Did you get all this? So I think Russ may have recognized. All right, like this was. It wasn't, right, but that's part. but that's a big that's a different that's a big deal because it wasn't because he felt like he was, um, in the wrong. I think or you know whatever. It's because he realized, oh crap, this is not a good look. And I look like a jackass. I look like a jack, and I so I'm going to fix it. And to his credit, look, it is really difficult what these guys are going through. It is humiliating, is embarrassing, and all that stuff. And guys can have bad days, but this has sort of become kind of the norm for Russ with the. The media, in except unless he's in one of those stretches where you know he's been playing better, and then everybody can say nice things about him, and he can talk about you know how you know I told you so. He didn't play bad in this game, but whatever. He was fine, but he was the only he was the only star there, and right. so I think that's you know it just it I I again it's not an apples to apples comparison you know, as I said earlier, but it just gave me that vibe of. Who's taking accountability around here? Who's sitting down and, and and you know, Russ threw the mini tantrum, stopped, fixed it to, you know, which is the appropriate thing to do. But the more appropriate thing to do is not to do that in the first place. And I just I, I that's the vibe I got off of it. And it to me just it was a it was a bad sign. It was one of the few times this year where I was just like, I, I'm not even gonna try to sort of defend or sympathize or empathize with what you know he was going through. It's just he's just being a jerk. Real quick before we go, um, because we we had noted that this would come up. Um, the there the question of whether or not Jason Kidd yeah, thanks because for, he, yeah. because he's been very good this year for Dallas. He's proved a mm -hmm. lot of skeptics, including you and I, but you know, guys like Nick Anstad who covers the Lakers, I mean the Mavericks for locked on Mavericks, like Tim McMahon who covers all the Texas teams for ESPN, like there have been a lot of skepticism about bringing in Kid. I think a lot of it deserved skepticism. Mm -hmm. But and who knows how long this will go? But for the time being, this season has really turned around, and there's been a lot of praise for Jason Kidd. And everybody knows he was Vogel's lead assistant for two seasons, and he really was the Lakers' first choice before yes. they ended up hiring. Yeah, Mavs Kidd. are Mavs are up to by the way a four seed with a chance, a very good chance to jump over a v struggling Warriors team. The Lakers three. very clearly mm -hmm. were not comfortable with the optics of bringing in Jason Kidd because of his past with domestic violence issues and 
other stuff, but he's very well respected by players, particularly LeBron. And it was mandatory for him to be on the staff of whoever they ended up hiring, which I think was a sticking point among other things with Ty Lu. But the idea of could Jason Kidd have gotten more out of this season, even with the context of everything that's gone wrong, things totally out of Frank Vogel's control than Frank Vogel. What do you think? Maybe. I mean, not, 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 I mean, the Lakers are 31 and 44 after Tuesday's loss. Does Jason Kidd, I'm assuming the same injuries, assuming the same roster, Mm -hmm. does, does Jason Kidd make a substantive difference? No, I don't think so. I think, you know, maybe they're, 33, 34 games, which you know obviously makes a difference in the standings where they'd be a, a solidly in the play-in as opposed to on the outside looking in. But like, I mean, honestly, I mean, if, if I told you the Lakers were 33 or 34 and, you know, 41 in, or 35 and 40 instead of 31 and 44, you wouldn't think to yourself, that's going well. I mean, it would still be a very disappointing season. I don't think there's anything Jason Kidd could have done to resurrect this. And I don't necessarily think that their record would be any different. It, you know, who knows? Maybe it could be worse. I don't know. But I, I just, I don't, this fundamentally, this is a question. Do you think this is on Frank Vogel or how much do you think this is on Frank Vogel? And I don't think he is the issue. I the only thing great. I just don't think he's been, I, I think this is a roster problem. And an, obviously an injury problem as much as the, a, more than the only problem. theory I would have in potentially in favor of of kid having more success than Frank Vogel, because you're right. These circumstances would be difficult for anybody mm-hmm. without the benefit of really knowing Jason Kidd's schemes and stuff. Like, I, I just I have not watched sure. Mavericks enough. The one area where maybe if you want to want to think about this as as a theoretical is would he have more buy in? from a Russell Westbrook immediately this season because of who he is and the gravitas Maybe. that he has you know, among players around the league, but particularly as a point guard, like point guard to point guard. And if, and I want to s- just make sure this is clear, this is truly an if because I don't know this to be the case. But if over the last couple seasons, Jason Kidd was a voice that guys like LeBron and AD – responded to as much, if not more, than Frank Vogel, even if Frank Vogel was ultimately the dude in charge, like if if Kidd was somebody who resonated more with those guys, mm-hmm. maybe you look at that cumulative effect and wonder if this year, a year that has included a lot of effort and desire and you know those sort of issues, you know, a buy-in issue, I think, has been there during the season. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's the one area where kid you could look at, look at it and say, "All right, I I, I could yeah, consider I think, it." To me, though, that's less about kid. I mean, the the Westbrook point guard thing, I guess, is an interesting one. But I think that's less about kid than just be any new coach. Um, no, I think anybody, I'm talking. I think I'm saying, but like to kid. me, like I, I know what you're saying. I'm saying to me, I I read a lot of that stuff as if they had a different guy a first year i mean you know a, a first year new coach new regime new whatever where like everybody's starting from fresh i think maybe some of those factors become more important and more viable for buy-in for everybody being kind of on the same page and buying in because they want to make this whole new thing work um i just i don't i don't i just again without like you say without having a benefit of really understanding jason kidd's schemes um I just don't think I don't think there's a coach out there that could save this that could make pretty it pretty damn hard play it way over their head outside of maybe the super elite guys the Ty Lues and stuff who seem to have a knack for turning Spolstra yeah the you know who can make anything into anything yeah um, but even then I think they'd, they'd struggle because if you go break down some of those teams they just they have the ingredients of athleticism or length or this or there's mm-hmm. something that that a coach can latch onto this team doesn't even really have that. Um, stuff. There's no strength. There's no one thing that you can lean into a hundred percent and just go like, yeah, okay, we'll do that. We'll do these two things come hell or high water. Um, all right. So Eric Pink is tomorrow. Uh, it will be a really informative show just to understand really how the Lakers got here, um, both from a player standpoint and an analysis that way, but also financially with the numbers and uh, some of the stuff that, that Rob Palenka is responsible for as a GM. Uh, it should be a great show. Make sure you're around for that one. 
uh locked on lakers on youtube andy and uh what else is that it pretty much it yeah, that is it. Got it all right we'll see everybody thursday <laughs>